looking at a Fairbanks Morse hit and miss. 15, 15 horsepower gasoline engine. What year would this be from, Ron? 1912. 1912. It's not very loud. Not in here. So, sure. So, does this have a, a magneto of some sort? Uh, no, we're using a battery and foil. Okay. So you got to prime it? Yep. I also need some gasoline for to start it. Are you just creating pressure now? No, it's a little pump. Or are you priming it? Oh, here you're coming out over here. See, that tells me that the mixer is full of gas. I see. So that's your valve? It's the intake valve. But this runs your valves? No, this locks the intake valve out on its off cycles. Oops, I'm going to stick in front of you. Oh. It hasn't run today, so. Do you generally run it every day? Uh, we're only here Wednesdays and Thursdays. Oh, so a couple times a week you run yeah. it? Yeah. That's moving your main, main that's crank? Mains, so wick oilers. How did you learn how to do this? I saw my first one of these when I was about 10 years old at a county fair, my mom said. And she said that um, I was so fascinated with that thing running that after almost an hour, my brothers and my dad were all off getting caramel apples and that. She had to come back and pull me away from it. <laughs> That's a good story. Since. Yeah. And now you got and one. I studied on them and, and I have about five or six of them at home. You have, you have some stationary engines at home? Yeah, but not this big. Uh. Do you know what this one was originally used for? I don't know what this one was originally used for. Oh, look at how that works. Nice. So you need to get it in a certain position to... Yeah, I can't pull it through a, through a compression stroke. That's smooth as silk, isn't it? Oh boy. Maybe we better stand back. <laughs> it's not that bad. There she goes. Isn't that something? So now is that does that regulate how much gas is coming in? You know not there. This is right. That's kind of your throttle. Not the throttle. It's the mix. The mixture. Okay.
So what is that every once in a while you get that? Come on out here, you hear it. You hear it out there. Is that a little backfire? No. That's the explosion. So that's one that one explosion gets the RPM back up. It's all gauged by RPM. So that's the only time it's exploding? Is every if that engine was really working, it would was bogged down, it'd be going more every time. So that's only firing like once every 10, 10 seconds? Oh, I did not. Uh, I get it's it. Hit and miss. I get it. So it doesn't hit and miss on a certain cycle. It's no. just hit and misses when it's necessary. Well, okay. Sounds like an old drama concert. Yeah. yeah. Everybody says that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just coasting and then boom, that's the explosion. I get it. See the weights on the flywheel here? Oh, so that's that's spreading out from some typical force. The faster it goes, the further up they go. You see that uh, collar on the crankshaft? Right. You see how the um, the governor is, is fingered into that? Right. It's moving it back and forth. And then you see the that's the exhaust valve. So that one explosion is enough to get the RPM up to where it wants to be. It latches the exhaust valve open. There's no, so there's no compression. So it just goes. And that's until you lose a little bit of RPM, and it tells it wants to fire again, then it lets it cycle, and that one explosion is enough to get the RPM back up. And the old saying when they say balls to the wall, that's when they, you know, when they had the... And the little ball type governor. Right, when they, the, they would spread out, and that, that was like flat out. Right. Now, once you got it running, this is our clutch. The whole thing doesn't run, but a little bit of it does. So you get the idea. So now she's going to fire a little more. That's cool, isn't it? That's pretty neat. So now is this water cool? Yeah, water cool. So it's how does it is it just draw through enough that it thermal siphon? Okay. Combustion cylinder chamber is is a jacket. A jacket, right, okay. Okay, so this is out. So as long as the water level is above here, and you got a sealed system, what does hot water tend to do? It's to rise. Go over the top, right? It's to rise. Right. So it'll start to, to rise, it'll come oh, okay. in here, but the cooler water displaces okay. it. Okay. The hotter it gets, pretty soon you have a pretty good circulation going. So this level must be the level yeah, of it's your... Too, it's too low. Oh, it's too yeah, low. Yeah, I, I need to put water in. I see. But you can run it for a little while without... I see. No. So does, it does, does it get warm? It takes a while. Yeah. Did you see it from behind? I did, but I'll have to look again. For a while now. Now, once you fire every cycle, you're starving. And you're starving. Not starving, it's because it's losing RPM. Oh, I see. Your governor is calling for. In fact, if I get the gas back. There it comes. And I'll try back to the speed. 
13, 12. In the 1860s. I don't know if, most people don't know that. Now, they didn't have rings. They didn't know about compression. They didn't know about rings. They didn't know about any of this. But they were experimenting with combustion engines. Probably right around the turn of the century, they started making some progress. By then, they had at least one ring. And uh, what really held them back was the ignition systems. Um, you heard me talk about an igniter here. Before the igniter, they use what they call hot tube ignition. In hot tube ignition, they picked a strategic place on the end of the combustion chamber and they brazed a, a bronze or a brass or a copper tube that was hollow, sealed at this end, but open to the combustion chamber. And it had a standing pilot under the end. It kept it red hot. So when it came up on compression, it forced part of that charge up into there and it was so hot it ignited it and exploded the mixture. Mm. So that was hot tube ignition. Pretty reliable. Mm. Go back a few years, around the turn of the century, they used slide valve ignition, which was a little port on the side of the combustion chamber with a mechanically operated slide valve with a standing pilot outside. Now I'm extrapolating a little bit here, but I think it was just past top dead center. Anything b before that, it would have snuffed, the, snuffed it. But just after top dead center, when it was on its stroke back, that opened momentarily, exposed that mixture to that flame, exploded it, and mm -hmm. just a momentary, it's called slide valve ignition. They say it was not very reliable. It was real crude. But uh, this kind of shows the evolution of them. Mm -hmm. So in the period of about 1910, 1915, these things started coming on the market and farmers in the Midwest loved them. Because if you think about it on a farm before that, everything was done by hand. It was hand cranked, it was hand lifted, it was, and that's why they had lots of kids. Everything was done by, yeah. by hand labor. Yeah. When those engines came along, and as you can see here, they could belt it up to anything. You could belt it up to a water pump, you could pump water, you could bump it to a corn grinder and, and grind chicken feed. You could hook it to a conveyor and put your hay up in the hayloft. Um, generate electricity. Saw, you, saw and wood. Saw wood. And if it was wash day, and you bought mom a new washing machine, you could drag that engine around to the back, belt it up to her washing machine, <laughs> and she didn't have to do this. <laughs> so they were a huge, popular uh, labor saver. And birth um, control device. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> so. Yeah. But... Um, when they started building the dams and the TVA and started electrifying America in a very short time, these became junk. Um, take that same farmer. He goes out in the, to the shed on a cold January morning to try to start this cantankerous, greasy, oily thing that may <laughs> not start, may start, or reach over on the wall and flip a switch. <laughs> and what's he going to do? These became junk. So they say that the... The, the major dis destruction of them was World War II. Uh, the scrap drives, they said they broke them up with sledgehammers by the tens of thousands uh, for the scrap metal. 
but today, if you find one, if they're not, I wouldn't say they're uncommon. They're not common, but they're not uncommon either. But if one survived, you have to surmise that it was either for someplace it was forgotten, it was somebody's uh, favorite thing, it was stuffed under a workbench, uh, it was just in, uh, somewhere where nobody thought about it. Mm -hmm. So that's how they survived. Or some remote mine where you couldn't get it carried back out of there? Right. Now that's a question that people ask. Uh, they'll find remnants of these and other machinery way up here where there was never a road. How did they get it there? Well, I'm pretty sure they probably took it apart, they packed it in on mules, then they put it back together. Now if you do that, now you've got a power source, and what do you have to pack in then? Five gallon can of gas, a little bit of oil, and battery once in a while. As long as you kept them oiled, and kept them lubricated, kept them, in, uh, kept them cooled, they run forever. This, this engine would run for weeks and days on end.